you know how in the Bible it says uh, to us Christians that how we see through a glass darkly? We only know in part. Uh, well, I understood that. But what happens, I read Romans 11. And in Romans 11, it says that the Jews were only blinded in part. So all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, we're partially blinded. The Jews are partially blinded. And the first group to humble themselves and look out of the other lens gets to see the clearer picture. So I started studying the feast from a Jewish perspective. And oh my goodness, does it really open things up? It's a paradigm shift, it really is. All of a sudden you're reading the Bible in full color 3D, uh, not just black and white text. It's, it's not a separate book. It's almost like you should tear out that middle page between the Old and the New Testament and, and realize uh, that we're all connected. We're not only connected to the Bible better, we're now connected to each other better. The Jews say that the Torah was not given to them until they were in the wilderness. And the reason it was given to them in the wilderness and not in the nation of Israel itself is because God wanted to communicate to them that the Torah is borderless and it is for all time and it is for all people. God has planned everything to the minute detail. Uh, we love looking at snowflakes, but how about looking at a snowflake under a microscope? All of a sudden you see the magnificent detail. Well, what my goal is, is to show everybody how awesome God is. I, I like to show not only the macro, but the micro level of God's Word. What I want to do is kind of put uh, 3D glasses on people. In one sense, to have the Bible, all of a sudden the words start popping out. And we see things like we've never seen before. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, uh, you might be familiar with the scripture that talks about the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. What does that mean to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world? What that means is the father planned Messiah's death from the beginning of creation. It's not like Jesus died and then all of a sudden the father goes, oh no, now what do we do? We got to go to plan two, you know, or plan B and resurrect him. What this is telling us is that our Father in heaven, what did He do? He pre-planned everything. He knows the end from the beginning. Think about this for a minute. What if you had a child? Let's say it's a teenager and had some disease and was going to die. And you had to plan your child's funeral while they were alive. Maybe the child even wanted to help plan the events of their funeral. I mean, this is so uh, horrible. I mean, talk about just pulling on your heart, having to plan your, I mean, your own child's funeral. A child should never die before their parent. But think about this. The Father in heaven was sending His Son, Yeshua, to come and die for us. Believe me, as the creator of the universe, He is going to be all over it. He says, I believe I'm going to determine what day my son's going to die. I'm going to determine what time he's going to die. Not only that, I'm going to determine what songs are going to be sung at my son's funeral. This is incredible. He had King David write the songs for Yeshua's funeral over a thousand years in advance. Do you remember it talking about them singing a hymn at the Last Supper? I know the words to the song they sang. I mean, most Christians, I mean, I, you know, I've been a Christian for almost 50 years. And it's like, what? You know the words to the song they sang at the Last Supper? Yes, once you connect to your Hebrew roots, your Jewish roots, and you learn the traditions, all of a sudden the Bible comes alive. What were they singing? They were singing Psalms 118. The Hallel 
is Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. The Psalms were their hymn book. And Psalms 118 is the last hymn that they always sing at every Passover Seder as well. That's their final song. And so what were the words that God had David write for his son's funeral right before he was betrayed and rejected? Psalms 118 has the verse, this is the stone the builders have rejected. It's become the headstone of the corner. This is incredible. God had this all pre-planned to the minute detail. The very next day, what happens? Mark records that they crucified Yeshua the third hour of the day. That's nine in the morning, time of the morning sacrifice. So think about this. At the very moment, the high priest is binding the Passover lamb to the horns of the altar that they're going to slay at the evening sacrifice. At that very moment, they're binding Yeshua to the cross. Now, Josephus recorded there were two million Jews in Jerusalem for Passover. Two million Jews. And guess what? They all are one. They're all singing the Psalms. Can you imagine if you're you're Jesus, you're getting nailed to the cross, and you hear this two million member choir, and what are they singing at the very moment they're singing Psalms 118? Because they sing the Hallel three times a day, at nine, noon, and three. And so here, at the third hour of the day, they're singing Psalm 118, which the ending verses are, bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. This is what he's hearing. And then at noon, what do we find? If you remember in the scriptures at noon, all of a sudden the lights go out. It's dark for three straight hours from noon until three. Now, if you remember, Yeshua said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Well, guess what he is hearing? Two million people sing as the sun goes dark. Can you imagine what two million people are doing? Here they've got their hymn book, so they have it memorized, and all of a sudden the the lights go out. And what does Yeshua hear everyone singing? Psalms 118, the right hand of the Lord is lifted up. The right hand of the Lord is being exalted. What do we find at three in the evening? That's the ninth hour of the day. That's the time of the evening sacrifice. At the very moment of the evening sacrifice at three in the afternoon in the slaying of the last Passover lamb, that's when Yeshua dies. At three in the afternoon, the time of the evening sacrifice, what are they doing? They're singing Psalm 118. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The very next day is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And and what do we find? Yeshua is buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he was unleavened without sin. Most Christians don't know that the Jews have been keeping the Feast of First Fruits every year for 1,500 years. And so, what do we find? Yeshua rose on the Feast of First Fruits. He became the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead on the very day. Fifty days later, we have uh, in Judaism what's called the counting of the Omer. But uh, in Christianity, they never heard of the Hebrew word for Pentecost. Most Christians as Shabbat, which means weeks. And so uh, most Christians, believe it or not, don't even know the Jews have been keeping Pentecost every year for 1,500 years. As a matter of fact, uh, I humorously say uh, most Pentecostals uh, don't even keep the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, And that's what they say their whole foundation is built on. But the Jews, they still keep the Feast of Pentecost to this day. But what do we see happened in the book of Acts? 
Peter says, these guys aren't drunk when the Spirit was poured out. It's what? It's the third hour of the day, nine in the morning, time of the morning sacrifice. So here again, we see this divine dress rehearsal, how everything with Messiah's first coming was planned, not only to the day, but to the very hour. things that I like to ask Christians is if they believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Almost every time I ask, I get a resounding, yes, of course he is. But then I like to ask them, well, now, wait a minute. Do you really believe that? Do you believe it up here or do you believe it in your heart? I mean, is there any shadow of turning with God or is he really the same yesterday, today, and forever? And when people tell me that, of course, yes, he is, then I like to unlock this revelation that just blows them away when all of a sudden they realize that that is true. And that is this, if the Lord fulfilled the feast, the spring feast to the very day, to the very hour of his first coming, he dies on Passover. He's buried on unleavened bread. He rises on the feast of first fruits. The Holy Spirit is poured out on the Jewish feast of Shavuot we know as Pentecost. If he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he fulfilled the spring feast to the very day of his first coming, he will fulfill the fall feast to the very day of his second coming. Think about that. He fulfilled the spring feast to the day. He'll fulfill the fall feast to the day. But if we're not on the calendar that God is on, we're going to miss the event. If, if you love God and, and you want to be there at the event, then it's, it's a good thing to be at the dress rehearsal. Think about this. Would you want to be at the wedding of the Messiah? Oh, yeah. And so I tell people, then why wouldn't you want to be at the dress rehearsal? Because... When we practice or do the dress rehearsals on the very day, we need to realize they're also doing the dress rehearsal in heaven. And that's what's so significant. It, it's like completing a circuit. The Feast of Trumpets is the coronation of the king. Do you want to be there when Yeshua is crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Can you imagine the hundreds of millions of people in heaven and they're all clapping their hands and they're rejoicing and Yeshua is crowned King of Kings. Every year on the Feast of Trumpets in heaven, they're practicing. Believe me, they are doing the dress rehearsal for his crowning. On that very same day on earth, we also do the dress rehearsal, re going through the, the practice of crowning Yeshua as king. At the very same time they are in heaven, on the very day, we don't know what year the event will happen, but guess what? One of these years, when we're shouting our praises and blowing our shofars at the same time they are in heaven, boom, it's gonna happen. We're gonna all of a sudden be moved right into the event and it won't be strange. It, it won't be something odd. It, it'll just be a beautiful flow of what God is already doing, and we're there. One of the main things for believers to realize is English really is not the best translation for biblical understanding. I mean, if all you have is English, then that's what you have. But if you want to study to show yourself approved, you really need to go back uh, to the original language or, or study those commentaries that really go into the original Hebrew language. Let me give you a great example of why that's so important. In Genesis uh, 1.14, God had said that he wanted there to be lights uh, in the heavens to divide the day from the night. And then he says this, let them be for signs, seasons, days, and years. Well, when we hear the word season, we think of winter, 
spring, summer or fall. But that is an incorrect translation. Believe it or not, the very Hebrew word that is translated as seasons in Genesis 1.14, that same word in Leviticus 23.2 where it talks about the feasts of the Lord, they take that word and translate it as feast. So now wait a minute, when I think of the word feast, I'm thinking of a big Thanksgiving turkey dinner or something or you know, a table full of food. So now wait a minute, does that Hebrew word mean fall or does it mean food? Actually, both translations are inaccurate. The Hebrew word is moed, and the Hebrew word literally means more like a divine appointment. In other words, God said, I want the sun and the moon to determine my divine appointments when I'm going to intersect human history. It all had to do with the biblical calendar that the Jews use. Because our pagan calendar that we use, here it is, in the 21st century. And the calendar that we use is based totally on the sun. But the calendar that the Muslims use is based totally on the moon. But in Genesis, God said, I want the sun and the moon to determine the, your calendar. And so believers are not on the right calendar. When it says for days and years, he's not talking about Monday through Friday or any year of this century. He's talking about the Shemitah year. He's talking about the year of Jubilee. He's talking about the holy days, not the days of the week. And so God created a calendar that he gave to the Jewish people to use. It's the biblical calendar and it's not the one we're on. I like to give the example of I used to live in Garden City, Kansas, which is right on the border of Central Time and Mountain Time. Now, unless you've ever experienced this, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But we had to have two clocks because you could be living in one time zone, you drive a mile, and you work in another time zone. And if you wanted to call somebody, you had to find out well, what time zone is to make sure that we can connect. Well, it's the same thing. We have to have the calendar we use because we're in the world. But God has a calendar he gave to us also that he wants us to use. I like to give the example, if you have a boss and your boss tells you, I want you to come in at two o'clock on Friday, we need to have a meeting. What would happen if you told your boss, sorry, that doesn't work in my schedule. Why don't you meet with me on Monday at three? More than likely, you won't have a job you know, on Monday when you come in. Well, it's the same thing. God has his own day timer, his own schedule, and he does want to make an appointment with you. And he has made an appointment with you. He said, these are the days I want to meet with you. These are the times I want to meet with you. And he's written you in the schedule. So it's so important that we meet with him at his appointed times. And that Hebrew word moed literally means an appointed time, like as a date timer. And then one of the most incredible things, in Leviticus 23, it says that these festivals, or these appointed times of the Lord, are to be holy convocations. Okay, now when we think of the word convocation, we think of a, an assembly, like a school has a convocation, everyone assembles together. But in Hebrew, it has a slight additional meaning. The Hebrew word is mikra, and it implies an assembly, but it also implies for a dress rehearsal. And so it's like, okay, we're coming together for a dress rehearsal. So uh, I, this is why the Jews for 1,500 years killed the Passover lamb on Passover. 
on Nisan 14th. In Leviticus, God said, I want you to kill the Passover lamb on the 14th of Nisan. The very next day, the 15th, is to begin the Feast of Unleavened Bread. God is very specific. Uh, how would you, do you think we should keep the 4th of July uh, in June? Uh, I mean, that doesn't make sense. I mean, keeping Thanksgiving in April? I mean, it's just not right. Well, it's the same thing. So for 1,500 years, every single year, at three in the afternoon, right at the time of the evening sacrifice, they slay uh, the Passover lamb. Why? Because Yeshua was going to die on Nisan 14 at three in the afternoon. So they were going through the dress rehearsal of slaying the Passover lamb every single year. These feasts are more than food. These feasts are divine appointments and more than divine appointments, they're dress rehearsals of the events that will happen to the very day, to the very hour. One of the things that really needs to be explained for people who are unfamiliar with the biblical calendar is how it compares to our calendar. And so if I can give you a comparison, it'll help us get a better handle of how the calendar flows. Just like for us, January 1st is the first day of the first month of the new year till December 31st. The biblical calendar when it comes to the religious calendar, Nisan 1, and I would, is the name of the first month, and I would say it's equivalent like to April 1st. So in your mind, if you could put April 1st being also the first of Nisan in Hebrew, uh, it's close. It's not always on that day, but that just helps uh, kind of map it out. Then on the religious calendar, uh, they have 12 months just like we do, but sometimes they have a 13th month called Adar 2. The reason why is on our calendar, as you know, we add one leap day every four years because it's based on the sun. The biblical calendar is based on both the sun and the moon. And so what they have to do, they add an entire month, seven times over a 19 year cycle. Uh, that way, Passover is always in the spring. If they didn't do that, Passover could end up being in October. And so God said, you have to keep it in uh, its season, which in this case is spring. Uh, so to keep Passover in the spring, uh, they add a uh, 13th month periodically. But so Nisan is the first month where most of the spring feasts were fulfilled. But now, since we're going to be looking at the fall feasts, when they're going to be fulfilled, people want to know, okay, if the spring feasts were fulfilled in the spring, the fall feasts will be fulfilled in the fall. So in the biblical calendar, it's called Tishri, T-I-S-H-R-I, -I, Tishri. That's equivalent to our September. And so that'll kind of help give you an idea, but it's exciting to realize these biblical end time events we know is going to happen sometime around September, or October. So we know when to be watching. This is so important. God told us to watch, but now we can keep that watch more focused.